Our presentation this morning is the Gospel from Isaiah. My first encounter with an Adventist messenger was in September of 1991. At that time, in a Soviet school, my teacher invited me to some meetings in the big drama theater in the center of the city. And she said, I went there and it was quite interesting. They've already run two programs and there are three more to go. I went to the program. And there was this noble-looking preacher. His name was Michael, Michael Olaine. Uh, he now lives in Sacramento in California. And he was speaking with confidence, with passion, with zeal. He also shared a lot of stories. It was so interesting. In fact, those meetings went for three hours each night. They started at 6 o'clock in the evening. There was the first program until 7, then the second program until 8, and then there were questions and answers from 8 to 9. The house was full of people who were looking for answers. People who spent decades under atheism and communism experienced real hunger, spiritual hunger. A few months before that, I was baptized in the Russian Orthodox Church. And uh, uh, in reality, I, when I discovered that that preacher was not Orthodox, but he was actually a Protestant, an Adventist, with a strange name, I at first, on one hand, was impressed by his presentations, but on the other hand, I did not want to receive what he was talking about. The truth was burning my heart. And in fact, on the last day, when I went there with a girl from my class, we were sitting next to each other, and when he invited the people to stand up and give, give their lives to Jesus, I thought, well, maybe to give my life to Jesus means to become a member of the Adventist Church. Uh, so I stayed. I did not stand up. The whole uh, auditorium stood up, and there were only a few people sitting. And I was among them, I said. And I told that girl who was sitting next to me from my class, I will never ever become an Edmund. I still remember me saying those words. Years later, when I've been training for ministry, uh, already an Adventist Christian, uh, with a passion to reach the world with the three angels' messages, I had a dream to meet that preacher again. For me, he was that first messenger on the stage. I never knew him in person. I knew about him. I knew that he was traveling here and there, that he went to America uh, to do his master's degree at the Fuller Seminary in Los Angeles. And uh, deep in my heart, I thought, well, one day I need to meet that man. I need to tell him about my experience of what happened to my life and how my life was changed and how the Lord made me from an opponent of the Adventist message to an advocate of an Adventist message. And in 1996, five years later, I was there at the seminary and uh, I walked in the foyer and suddenly I, I saw him. He was standing there just talking to a lady at the reception. At that moment, I had goosebumps on my skin. For me, that man uh, looked like Jesus. He had a beautiful beard. In reality, you could put him in a movie as an actor and he would look like Christ. And as I greeted him, I shared with him my story. He hugged me so warmly, so nicely. He was so glad. And in later years, we became the best friends. In reality, in 2010, when I had already been living in Australia, uh, in the central coast, in Kurenbong, uh at that time, my wife Eleanor was a lady minister in a small church in a little town called Waiyi. And uh, in Waiyi, uh, it's only a small, a small place, about probably uh, 3,000 population. And there's a tiny Adventist church, th uh, three zero people, 30 people. And when Eleanor went there for the first time, uh, a couple of local elders told her, uh, you know, Waiyi is a very difficult place because that little town 
uh, the community decided uh, not to have any Christian churches. And I'm talking about Australia. I'm not talking about uh, say Romania in the days of Nicolae Ceausescu. Uh, and uh, uh, so for us to build an Adventist church here, it took us five years just to get permission from the council because the local community regularly protested against the appearance of a church. Previously, they had a tiny little church, uh, which was a small uniting church, uh, the, uh, the size of about 25 square meters. It was a small old wooden building, 100 years old, which was closed and was not even operating. And suddenly, Adventists come and on the edge of the town, build a church. So, uh, and, uh, so the elder said, this place is tough. People here are not responding. They will not want to come because we tried many times, all sorts of different outreach programs, no response. The community doesn't come. At that moment I thought, Lord, please make a miracle and let the people come. So I rang my friend Michael at that time, he was living in Sacramento, and said, I have a very tough place in the strait, where the local community does not want to come to any meetings. He said, let's try it. Let's give it a go. And uh, I invited him. We paid his airfares to come. Uh, we printed 900 invitations. And we went in that community from door to door giving invitations to the people. Was it easy? No. Uh, when we knocked on uh, one dwelling, the lady uh, rushed out and she started yelling at me and a young gentleman who was accompanying me and she said get out of here and I should never see you again. As we continued along the street uh, there was another dwelling uh, where the dogs ran and uh, they attacked the young man who was helping me distribute the uh, leaflets so I hugged him, turned around and the dog beat me uh, in the leg. <laughs> okay, so that was another house. Uh, and I know that in Australia generally speaking dogs are Super friendly, all right. And Australian dogs are often more friendly than humans. Uh, and uh, uh, in Australia, I you can walk around, and if you see any dogs anywhere, they never attack humans because they breed them nice. They, they, there's a lot of control. But I was stunned that after living in Australia for eight months, I was actually beaten by a dog uh, that tore my trousers and. And the man who walked out, following the dog, he never apologized. He said, oh, are you all right? Everything okay? And uh, I said, look, this is an invitation. We'll invite you to a very special seminar. And um, so uh, to even invite people in that community was quite an adventure. Uh, but ultimately, uh, to cut the story short, on the first day, 10 people, 10, 1, 0, souls from the community who have never crossed uh, the threshold of our church came to the first program. And five of them stayed till the end. And my friend, Pastor Michael, kept preaching until the end to this. And today, Waiyi has one of Australia's best community centers that is run by Adventists with a very powerful welfare program for the local community because the community there is quite low socioeconomic. And the community over the years had a complete turnaround as far as their opinion is concerned. Now, when people come to Waiyi, and it's been 13 years, I know the pastor at Waiyi, he's my good friend, he used to be my associate pastor. He says, uh, the dim, the local community now, uh, when people come and ask, what, what good things do you have in Waiyi? The community points to this church and to the community center. Uh, that's the very place that they resisted from building more than five years. Uh, I'm sharing these stories with you to talk, tell you about how the Lord is taking all of us through different labyrinths of life's journeys. And uh, a, a little thought from this experience is that I was really waiting for a moment to meet that man who brought the three angels message to my life. It took me many years, but I always lived with that dream. And I was thinking, when I meet him, when I tell him of what he did to me, of how his preaching impacted me, I lived in that 
a pleasant anticipation of meeting the man who brought me to the Lord. 800 years before Christ was born, in the country of Israel, just think about, uh, it's a country with, uh, with cities which in reality could be called towns. They were very small. In reality, uh, a good size city in those days in the Middle East would not exceed the size of this lake next to which you and I today are worshipping. Uh, if you travel to the archaeological site of the city of Jericho, you remember Jericho, which the Israelis walked around seven times during seven days? The city of Jericho, the entire city of Jericho would be half the size of this lake. That's how small it was. The vast majority of people lived in the rural areas. They were shepherds. They were growing grapes, olives, wheat. Agriculture was the main source of income. No mobile phones. In the evening, when the sun set down, it's dark. There are no street lights. Only here and there you could see small lights of... Uh, even candles did not exist. They had to have those... Uh, special lights that they used oil for, made of clay. That would not give too much light, very low visibility. Traveling at night was dangerous because there were thieves and robbers on the roads. Caravans had to be escorted by the military. A small country of Israel was not a, not a strong country, it was a very feeble country. In fact, if you go to uh, the history textbooks of the ancient world, uh, there is very little room that uh, ancient history dedicates to Israel. They focus more on Egypt, on Assyria, on Babylon, on Persia, on Greece, on Rome, on ancient India, ancient China. Um, uh, very little is dedicated in the textbooks to Israel because Israel was such a small place with such a little political footprint in, uh, in the society of that time often invaded by the surrounding countries. Thousands of people taken into captivity. In a place with little irrigation, uh, mostly desert, where people had to rely on the rain season, the season of the so-called early rain and the season of the late or later rain. And it is in that country where the local population was very different to the rest of the world. Their worship place was the temple. And I think a lot of visitors of King Solomon who came to visit him, including the Queen of Sheba, would ask questions. Where is your God? They would walk into the temple and all they see is bare walls. They see a large curtain. No one can go inside. And a traveler would ask a question, well, is there anything behind that curtain? Well, there's nothing. There's just a small wooden box covered with gold. And there are ten commandments inside. That's all we have. They were worshipping the invisible God. And they also remembered the promises that God gave to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said, Abraham, your descendants will be like stars in the sky. The Jewish people will look at each other and say, look, but we're only a, a very small nation. There are more stars than us. How can this promise of God be realized, be fulfilled? Also God told Abraham, in your seed, which means uh, in your posterity, in your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And the Jewish people are asking a question, but how can this happen? How can... We, such a small nation that has no respect, no political weight, no military might, how can we actually be a blessing to the nations of the world? There would be a lot of questions. And for decades and even hundreds of years, the Jewish people look up in the sky and say, God, you are a strange God. We don't see you. All we have is just some words from the great general Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, other books here and there. Sometimes 
prophets would come and speak to us. But it wouldn't be easier for us to at least have some kind of a visual reference, like the Egyptians have. They have those temples. Look at the gods they built. Uh, they carve from stone, from marble, uh, from wood. Uh, and I, I can understand the people in those times, because it's not easy to be a minority. And the Jewish people were a minority in every sense of this word. They were a minority physically, politically, militarily, socially, economically, and even religiously, because their religion was very, very small. And yet, they had the greatest knowledge the new, the only true God. They sang the Psalms of David, who said, All nations of the world, all gods of the world are idols, but God made the heaven. They believed in the invisible God. Yes, their faith was not a very easy experience at times. Because their faith emphasized them. Their faith did not allow them to go out and steal. Their faith invited them to observe the Sabbath week. Their, sab their faith told them to take effort and time to practice their knowledge of Torah, to write the words of Moses on every corner of their house, on the doorposts. They prayed. They brought animals as sacrifices and they were told by the priests that every time an animal dies, it's a symbol of someone dying for your sins. And one day, when the nation was on another brink of apostasy, when people were tempted again to say, look, look, we've had enough of it. We've been around here for 700 years and all these promises to Abraham seem to have been left unrealized because... We've been waiting for 700 years and we still haven't blessed the nations of the world. We still haven't multiplied at the stars of heaven. We still don't have that wondrous, beautiful life that Moses was talking about in the book of Deuteronomy when he was talking about blessings and curses. We still have so many things unrealized, unfulfilled, and how long should we wait for that? On the other hand, look, the, the pagans around us, they're just having a good life. They're having a wonderful time. Why should we isolate ourselves, be hermits, spiritual hermits in this world of pleasure? And when all of those things were happening, and all, moreover, the Jewish people say, well, but here and there, these Egyptians, the Syrians, they come and, and they destroy us, they besiege our cities, they take women as and children, they, they enslave us in the days of, the, of such desperate times. As you all know, God would send the Jewish people his prophets. People who were often unschooled, uneducated, with little social value and weight and respect. And one of those prophets, as you know, was the prophet Isaiah, who comes on, uh, on the scene of history about 800 years before Christ. He was a very strange man, a man with a loud voice, a man who shared his visions with the people. And it would be the, uh, the prophet Isaiah who would describe God most beautifully in the Old Testament. We've just heard the memory verse. Just look at the gospel from Isaiah. The gospel, uh, the Greek word gospel means the good news. Of course, the word gospel did not exist in the days of of Isaiah, but in essence, Isaiah was that messenger, was that carrier of good news to his people and the rest of the world. Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as what? As white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like in this text, Isaiah is calling for a transformation in society. Uh, some people ask a question, why is it that Isaiah is mentioning scarlet and crimson? Could you find uh, another synonym 
uh, for the word colored and crimson. What color is that? Red. Why is it that they use the word red, scarlet, crimson? Why not black? Why not blue? Why is it that it is the sins are compared to something that is of red color? Well, it's easy to understand because uh, Israel had a lot of neighbors, and one of its neighbors was the Phoenician city of Tyre. The Phoenicians in the city of Tyre, uh, they mastered the art of creating new paints. Phoenicians would break the shelves. They found a special kind of shelves in the Mediterranean Sea. And if you grind those shelves, you will get that red color. They made paint. And, uh, and using that paint from, uh, from the shells, from the seashells, they painted the fabric. And that fabric was very expensive. It was the fashion of that time. And you will notice that even if you watch uh, the movies describing the lives of people in the ancient world, you will see that often many great generals like Alexander the Great or the Roman generals, they would have uh, their garments made of that red color. Red was a color of nobility, of wealth, of richness, uh, and of influence and importance. Many kings would dress in red. You remember in the parable of Jesus about the rich man and Lazarus, you remember the rich man dressed himself on a daily basis into what? Into the red clothes, into scarlet clothes. And uh, because that was the symbol of wealth. So the red color was the symbol of the wealth of Tyre. And you remember uh, Tyre had economic relations with the Israelites and the uh, and Ty, the king of Tyre, as you remember, even supplied timber for the construction of the temple in Jerusalem in the days of Solomon. But 200 years later, the people of Israel are so tempted by the pagan nations surrounding them, they are tempted by their wealth, their riches, their religion, their idolatry, that for Isaiah, the red color of Tyre, the red color of their wealth becomes the symbol of sin and the pagan faith. So, uh, red color is not bad by itself, but the red color here, the comparison is obviously drawn from the symbol of wealth, riches, and the pagan religion. And Isaiah says, Jewish people, my brothers and sisters, you are living in your sin, and you look, uh, by putting yourselves into those garments of the city of Tyre, into those Phoenician fa fashionable things, you're plunging them, yourselves into their sins. But if you come to the Lord, He wants you to go back to your origin. When you were shepherds, and you would make clothes made of wool that symbolized purity and your simple faith in God. You will be as white as snow and yes, there are mountains in Israel, and in winter, uh, sometimes on the top of those mountains, there is snow. And we know that in the Old Testament, God was often called the God of mountains. And when Isaiah says, come, and your sins will be as white as snow, he uh, symbolically takes the people of Israel on the top of those mountains, which are white as snow, that's where they find God. So the whiteness of snow does not only symbolize purity, as we understand it today, for the people of Israel who are listening to Isaiah, they immediately think of snow on the mountains, and that's where they would go up and pray to the creator of the universe. So this invitation to come and reason together and have your sins that are, uh, and your garments uh, that are like scarlet, that are like crimson, to be turned into white and to be turned into wool is the symbol of forgiveness on one hand, but on the other hand, it's the symbol of transformation. It's the symbol of regeneration, because God never brings forgiveness of sins without transforming our lives. And when you read the book of Isaiah, you find those beautiful gospel messages almost on every page, almost in every chapter. Look at chapter 2, when Isaiah talks about the future world where God's children reign. He says, it'll be a world full of peace. 
where people will no longer fight. And the people of Israel are listening to Isaiah somewhere in the street and are saying, but how is this possible when there are swordsmen walking around us all the time? When the nations around us have those gigantic armies, professional armies, aimed at conquering and taking people, people and their possessions, taking lives, taking slaves. Isaiah says, my friends, a day is coming when people will take their swords, take them to the blacksmith, and make what? And make plows. They will make agricultural instruments. How I wish in the modern world that all the great countries that increase their weaponry and spend millions of tons of iron ore to produce machine guns, tanks, planes. I, I wish all of that was used to produce agricultural tools. To say, turn the Sahara Desert into a fruit-yielding oasis. How I wish that all the military budgets in the world would be spent on bringing peace and feeding those who are hungry and are starving. Did you know that every minute, because of starvation, 18 children die who haven't reached the age of five years? Just think about it. As you are sitting here and the clock is ticking, once the arrow ticks 60, somewhere in the world, 16, 18 children, who are just little ones. They even haven't been to school. They died. Starved. And Isaiah the prophet was raising his voice loud. When God comes and brings his kingdom to earth, people will take all their weapons and turn them into the agriculture. The people of Israel, will, of course, will ask, but how is it possible? Because we are so unstable. We're so shaky. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, Isaiah will talk about the king of Babylon as the symbol of Lucifer. In fact, the word Lucifer, as uh, found in the Vulgate, in the Latin translation of the Old Testament, uh, as Lucifer is symbolized by the rebellious king of Babylon, who fell from the sky like the morning star. So the Lucifer is introduced for the first time so vividly in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. The scenes of great controversy are there. And uh, Isaiah, in many chapters of his book, will emphasize the fact that the people of Israel were called to be his children and called to be his witnesses to the whole world. Not to be focused at themselves, but to be focused on the outside. And Isaiah says, look, God understands that you do not deserve his glory. That there's not a clean spot on you. Remember, it is in the book of Isaiah, uh, in uh, chapter 64, verse 6, where God will say that our righteousness is like what? Like filthy rags. We're so dirty that it's impossible to skin a human being without killing him. But he says, there is hope. God is a son. So the messianic prophecy is pronounced in the book of Isaiah and is repeated over and over and over again. Isaiah 7, 14. You remember when Isaiah says, God will give us a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they'll call him what? Ooh, Emmanuel. Which means God. Isaiah is one of the first prophets in the Old Testament who uh, declares the incarnation. Incarnation means that a spiritual being becomes carnal, a human being, with flesh. And you know that 800 years later, Jesus would fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, Isaiah proclaims the true king, and he says, Our king is not a warrior with a sword. He's not a man full of hatred. 
our warrior. He's a child. Our king, who is also called a counselor, who is so wise that you can seek all wisdom from him. Who is the everlasting father, who is our God. He is the real king of Israel. I think Isaiah 9, 6, talking about this beautiful child that is given to us, Isaiah tells the people of Israel, it's one of the most beautiful verses about Jesus Christ in the whole Bible. It would be towards the end of his book that he would dedicate the whole section. In those days, of course, his book was not subdivided into 66 chapters as it is today. It was just one solid document, one solid writing from A to Z, from the first words, the words till the last. And it would be in uh, Isaiah 53, where you see the picture of a suffering servant, where you see the picture of Jesus dying, suffering, and paying the full price for your sin. And at the end of the book of Isaiah, you see the picture of redemption, the final realization of all hopes and desires of humans in all times. You see a picture of a kingdom where Isaiah says, an old man dies as a young man, which means he doesn't die at all. Where people are not giving birth to children to grieve. Where the heavens and the earth come together every Sabbath to worship God. Isaiah, the beautiful book, the big book, 66 chapter, a lot of messages. Lots of verses. Covering a, a wide range of topics. But in the middle of the book of Isaiah. Stands the picture of God. This awesome God. Who stunned Isaiah with his glory. In chapter 6 where he says. Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says. Well Lord. Send me. On one hand you see. Uh, this uh, splendor. This majesty of God in Isaiah. On the other hand, you see God's humility. You see God's love, His character, full of passion and care. The God who is giving, loving, and conforming. My precious Packenham Church family and those who are watching us live and will watch the recording later, our loving God. And when you read the Bible, from every page, every chapter, every verse, a message flies into the mind and to the world. God, don't wait. Come and reason together. If your sins are read, don't worry about it. Take them. Don't be worried. Father in heaven, they will come to you as your community of faith, seeking your presence in our lives and asking you to change us and transform us as we are all waiting for the coming of Christ. The people of Israel had another 800 years to wait after Isaiah before Jesus came. And now we as Christians at the dawn of time realize that we've been waiting for 2,000 years for him to return. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And let all these wonderful chapters of Isaiah talking about the world of tomorrow be realized in us.